He is an EM physician and uh, with a special interest in trauma. He has worked overseas in a few MCCs in London. He does offer a C-spine course. Um, they're currently on hold at the moment, but if you ever do want to have a C-spine course, I'm sure you can speak to him. And he's going to be talking to us today about unstable C-spine injuries. So let's get to it. Okay, guys. So, I mean, um, you guys spoke about the talk. that I did a workshop, but it's a six-hour workshop. And the thing about the workshop is uh, it's divided into two hours, tea, two hours, lunch, two hours. And the, the topics in C-spine essentially spans normal anatomy, which we're going to do now quickly. And we're just going to go through stable and unstable fractures. And then we're going to touch on reduction of unifacet and bifacet uh, reduction, subluxation reductions. The other topics that should be covered would be pediatric C-spine, which is extremely important, uh, geriatric C-spine and hard collar usage. And then you can also touch, we touch a little bit on the CT interpretation, but today is mainly about X-rays. Okay. Um, we all know the anatomy, seven cervical vertebrae as we go down, there it is, you know where it is with a hairy bone. C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, what I normally do in the workshop is I have um, a, a C-spine with little bones apart and you all get to play with the little bones and see how it fits in. And the goal of the future workshop would be every person to have their own model and you take the model home of the, of the C-spine. But you need to find them somewhere, take it apart and have a good look at it. It helps give you a better understanding of what you're looking at on an X-ray and then on a CT. So just another anatomy picture, four, five, and six with seven. So why do we look at cervical spine x-rays? Are you guys, can everyone hear? Does, does anyone think that it's still necessary for us to look at x-rays? Mm. Oh, okay. So th th there's a, why do we still look at x-rays? If you look at what's on the slide, it says up to 20% are missed with conventional x-rays. So why do we do it? And if you look at the sensitivity and specificity, sensitivity is low, specificity is Hi, but why are we just not scanning everyone? So the answer really is that, is that we don't have 24 hour access to radiology orthopedic opinion. Very few units, unless you're a tertiary center has 24 hour access to CT and most definitely MRI uh, in this country. If you're working elsewhere, that's a bit different. If you're working in a first world environment, you do have access in most units to 24 hour CT and MRI. So it's essentially and it's critically important that we still, as EM physicians not working in tertiary institutions, know how to interpret C-spine x-rays. Okay. I added this and legislation, but we'll look at that at the end of the talk. We'll just quickly go through this legislation and reduction within four hours. We actually had a patient last night, yesterday in the trauma unit that needed to be reduced. So let's go on to the basics. If you guys look, if I move the arrow, can everyone see it? I think you can. Eh? So yeah. if you look at the, the, the picture, you can divide your C-spine into, into three groups, okay? The two circles, as in C1, C2, the smaller ones with the little split tails, C3, 4, and 5, and the bigger ones with the longest spinous process, that's bifid. If you look, the, the transverse processes and the pedicles are all very similar. And of course, the canal is similar. So you need to think of a C-spine in three parts. Okay, the circles, the three smaller ones, three, four, and five, and the slightly bigger ones with the longer spinous processes. And the reason we say that is because various fractures on C1 and C2 described as three, four, and five, you get various pathological fracture processes, which we'll look at. The same with six and seven. Six and seven more spinous processes, three, four, and five more your subluxations and your um, facet dislocations, and then one and two your Jefferson type and hangman type fractures. Uh, we went so uh, essentially the same body, foramen, etc., the facets. The this slide just says distinguishing features. We've sort of already said that. Smallest are the movable or movable vertebrae. If you look at C1, unique that it's a ring. C2 has got a peg, a dens. We know there's type one, two, and three dens fractures. Three to five are similar, six and seven are similar. Okay, just another picture. 
The reason I showed, uh, I put this picture up is if you look where the arrow is, these superior articular facets, the facets are really important. So in terms of subluxation and dislocations, right? Uni and bifacet dislocations. And you can see that on x-rays, particularly your lateral view, uh, and then we'll look at how we're going to interpret that and how you can determine which is more severe. Okay, this is just to show the vertebral artery and the horns, the phrenic nerve, I emphasized that. We actually had a guy recently with a C5 phrenic diaphragmatic injury, which is always a respiratory issue. The Dennis three column model is described. It can be divided into three columns, anterior, middle and posterior. The stability must be at least two intact columns. I've got another picture in terms of the Dennis. We don't really use the Dennis model because it becomes very complicated. If you look over here, there's anterior, middle and posterior with various anatomical substructures. The orthopedic surgeons and the spinal and neurosurgeons use the Dennis model more frequently, whereas EM physicians use just stable versus unstable. OK, so just more pictures of the Dennis model. I just want to go to one over here. Uh, I'm going to go back up, guys, don't worry. Uh, lost it. The Dennis model, just be aware of the Dennis model, just be aware that it's various columns and be aware that the orthopods, neuro and spinal surgeons use it more often. Just the basic anatomy, in terms of basic anatomy, you need to be able to have your views. We'll look at your standard views. We all know this. I know a lot of this might be a medical student, but we're just going through some revision. C1 to C7 T1, this is a great lateral X-ray. OK, you must be able to look at your ADI. You must be able to see soft tissue contours in front of C2 and C6. OK, look at your spinous processes so you can determine what your lines are. OK, and C71 would be your swimmer's view if you can't see it. Tracheal process, hyoid bone, good shadows, and the airway seems fine. OK, the same with the anterior. You must be able to see all your vertebral bodies. You must be able to see the spinous processes. Therefore, the depth of the x-ray should be correct. And then the first rib. Open mouth. Who of you guys have worked at Tigerberg trauma? So most of you. I'm still fighting with Prof Pitcher in terms of why they're only doing lateral x-rays. So you ask for a C-spine screen and they do a lateral x-ray and that's it. They might do a swimmers. They don't do open mouth and anterior. But open mouth, extremely important when we look at pathology, is looking at your C1, C2, looking at the spaces, looking at the dens, okay, and looking at the gaps and determining whether you have Jefferson hamstring fractures or not. All right. Just interpretation processes. Count the vertebra, assess the curvature, assess the vertebral alignment, your four lines. Some people speak of five. You assess your bone integrity into vertebral disc spaces. O double A joint and the soft tissues. This is the gold standard way to interpret a C spine X ray. Okay, go through it systematically, just like you guys go through a chest X ray. Whichever order you do it doesn't matter. Just try and make sure that you cover all the bases and make sure you go through your checklist. Now, the correct views. Is everyone still there? Hello? Yes, yeah, we still here. Here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is very strange talking to a computer alone. I'll, I'll message <laughs> you if something happens or not. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the correct views, lateral AP open mouth swimmers. Easy, basic. Um, a lot of the correct views depend on the skill of the radiographer. They can be bad and they don't do it correctly and then you have to fight and argue with them. The other issue is the collar might be too tight, incorrectly placed. And the excuse comes from them that they can't get a proper open mouth. But then they should call the doctor for assistance for inline stabilization, remove the collar and do an open mouth. We all know this doesn't happen most of the time. So we tend to fight for correct views, but it's worth the fight because if you don't have your correct views, you interpret incorrectly, that's a problem. And if you want to refer a patient for tertiary screening, as in CTs or MRI, you shouldn't send them with incorrect radio uh, x-ray views. You should make sure your views are correct, interpret, and then send. Okay, so this is a nice lateral. Going from outside in, soft tissue or not, it depends on what you want to do. You can count one, two, three, four, five, six. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
just the top of T1 that I can see there. There's my ADI, there's my C2, there's my C6. And the numbers you need to remember, and you should know this, is ADI adult three millimeters, pediatrics five millimeters. The reason being ligamentous laxity in a child. So ADI really important. C2 is six millimeters, C6 is 22 millimeters. Those are the easiest numbers to remember. Okay, some book, books say 20, 21, what have you, but C2 is 6, C6 is 22, ADI is 3, soft tissue. Just remember, and I think I might have a few pictures of that, you can have no soft tissue swelling anterior vertebral bodies and you could still have subluxation or uh, dislocation. So soft tissue swelling on its own is not sensitive enough, okay? Spinous processes, we'll go through that now, and then no foreign bodies. AP, essentially looking at your alignment of spinous processes all the way down into vertebral spaces, no fracture, no subluxation, dislocation, no disc prolapses. Open mouth, this one is interesting. So C1, C2 with the peg. You can clearly see this, I can't draw on the thing. Oh can clearly see that distance versus that distance is non-equidistant. When you see that, you need to compare the two tips there. If the two tips are aligned, then it's acceptable. But if your tips are out, then you know there's a problem. Normally, this kind of thing could be a ligamentous injury, not so much a structural bony issue. And that needs to be measured and reported on. Swimmer's view, we all know what a swimmer's view is to get your C7, T1. The lines, you saw in the first thing it said four, but others say five. So anterior prevertebral, anterior vertebral body, posterior vertebral body, spinal lamina, and spinous processes lines. One, two, three, four. The one that's missing here is the soft tissue. So we all know how to do that. One, two, three, four. Okay. Basics, we're just going through it fast. Okay. Same picture. I think you guys have access to this PowerPoint. I'm not sure but you can go through it whenever you want, okay? There's your five lines, just inclusion of the soft tissue line. So pre-vertebral soft tissue line. The reason it's excluded in these is because it can be quite irregular and it's not necessarily anatomically right unless you put your measurements in. Vertebral body posterior, anterior, spinal lamina and spinous processes. Remember the spinous processes? If you draw a line through every spinous process going horizontally across, there's a point here where they should converge in a normal spine. We don't do that routinely, okay? But they should all converge over there. The measurements, as we said, ADI, 3, C2, 6, C6, 22. You can't forget these, and you need to know that easy numbers, not a problem to remember that. ADI, again, uh, if you look over here, it says ADI more than 5, but it's so normal ADI, ADI less than three in males, 2.5 in females. We just collectively go for adults, three millimeters. Sometimes or most of the time, the x-rays are not clear enough to have this 2.5, three millimeter distinction. So we just go less than three. This number less than four in South Africa and at Red Cross at least, and over here we use the number five. All right, so less than five in pediatrics. And there's your distance. Um, just a question if anyone can answer. Are you routinely doing ADI measurements? Anyone? No. Okay, don't worry. We can pull we can that. Pull. You pull that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, pull that. <laughs> well, just to give you a response from the last poll. Um, we had a 71% response to say that uh, pain film x-rays are helpful mm. and 8% thought that it was unhelpful in the age of advanced, advanced cervical spine imaging. And generally, the responses to ADI are no. No, okay. So, so okay, that's great. Thanks. So in, remember, every measurement in a in a C spine, in an X-ray of a C spine, it's a collective. It's not a single measurement on its own. So it's getting correct views, seeing the vertebrae, soft tissue spaces, spinal laminar lines, 
with the imaging, with the clinical picture, it's not one measurement on its own. So you need to do ADI, you need to do all the other measurements along with history, et cetera, and clinical exam to come up with a good impression of what's going on. Um, nasopharyngeal space, this measurement, we don't do that often. We don't do that one either. And the retrotracheal space, but yes, but we'll do that on our 22. So same thing. So what we, what I'm trying to say here is on the PAC system. So we do it, uh, everyone's got PACs from what I know, Kailicha, Tigerberg, what have you. Measure it, measure it on your PACs. I think that's my next picture. So measure it physically on the PACs. And as far as I know, unless you delete it, it's saved. So actually someone will always check that you've done the measurement. So ADI, C2 and C6. Yeah, we did it on a PAC system. So there's the ADI measured at three and then the six, and then 15. Okay. What is, I can't ask you guys questions, it's a bit difficult. So this C-spine, the pre-vertebral soft tissue is fine, but there's significant loss of lordosis in this C-spine X-ray. You can see that this, this patient is almost hyperextend type flexing because of the pain. So you need to look at that as well. Here's a nice picture of, Pre-vertebral soft tissue swelling at C2 being eight millimeters, and there's definitely an issue going on there. All right, this is not an adequate C-spine X-ray. You can see still on a spine board. This looks like a Lodox image, um, but already you can see there's a problem. You would ask for adequate images first, or you would go straight to a head and neck CT. Uh, we've gone through this spinous processes, the height of the bodies and the height of the joint space in the AP views. Right. Open mouth view, we sort of looked at that. So looking at your peg, looking at your arches and the distances between the two. Okay. The, a lot of the problem you'll find, so there's a tongue ring in this patient and it obscures most of your imaging. Not so much your distances over here and here that you can measure, but the actual dens. So there's two things that obscure your dens and that would be a foreign body like this or the two incisor teeth and it can look like there is a fracture or not. In the old days we used to do x-ray tomograms. If you think there's something just to get a 3D view of the peg but now if you think there's an issue rather just scan the patient. Uh, that's just a, just a picture of what a cord injury looks like. Clinical decision rules really, 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 really important. Not so much in tertiary centers because patients get referred to us for more advanced imaging. Clinical decision rules, most certainly CHCs, district, regional, if you don't have imaging, and also in mass casualty type situations where you need to screen out and not x-ray everyone. Okay, are they validated? Yes, they are. Nexus versus Canadian, you guys should all know these numbers for your exams because someone's going to ask it to you. Canadian is slightly better in both sensitivity and specificity. More complicated, no one remembers it unless you got it on your phone. We all remember Nexus, used more often. Okay, so we all use Nexus. Whether it's used a lot in a tertiary centre is debatable uh, for many reasons, but you need to know it. So there's Nexus and there's Canadian C spine. You should all be really well familiar with this and you need to know these numbers in your sleep. 90, 36, 99, 45. Okay. In terms of cervical spine injuries, there's a big distinction between adults versus children. You need to understand where to where your eye should go in a child's x-ray of the C-spine and where your eye should go in an adult based on history, mechanism, etc., clinical exam. But 25% occiput C2, 75% C3 to C7, okay? This is mainly your adult pattern and more your pediatric pattern, All right? Dennis, stable versus unstable, All right? So we go for stable versus unstable. So this is where we want to actually start the lecture. Stable versus unstable. Dennis is way too complex. Our colleagues use it. Um, and we prefer the simple things, right? Okay, so you need to know the basics, you need to know the basic anatomy, you need to have a systematic review of a C-spine, you need to understand the bones. 
your first two, the two circles, the three small ones, small tails, and the three bigger ones, long tails. And then you need to remember this, also in your sleep, stable cervical spine injuries versus unstable fractures. Okay. Stable being wedge fractures, vertebral body burst fractures. This one is very debatable. And our orthopedic colleagues don't agree with this, right? Vertebral body burst fractures, they feel can be unstable. Clay shovelers fracture we see quite often. Transverse processes fractures we see more often. And then the other disagreement is a unilateral facet dislocation is not necessarily stable, All right? So stable, in our opinion, from EM is a wedge, a clay shovelers, and a transverse process. Debatable vertebral body burst and unilateral facet dislocation. It's quite clear. And then the unstable, uh, um, something I found on the internet, which is quite easy way to remember it. I'm sure everyone's heard of the Jefferson Biddle for Hangman's Thumb. There's a nice graphic picture. You guys should copy it and stick it somewhere. And then obviously here, Jefferson fracture is number one, a bilateral facet dislocation where I've got some nice pictures and we're going to go through that because that involves a cone caliper reduction, a dantoid type two and three, and then any fracture dislocation, a hangman's fracture, which we do see, I mean, we don't hang people anymore, but we do see it in our motor vehicle accident, car that rolled, and then they have seat belt entrapment and it creates an incomplete hangman's fracture and then teardrop fractures. Okay, teardrop fractures, so many times we see teardrop fractures and we don't know should we refer, should we not refer, it's better just to refer CT MRI. Okay, okay, so what I'm saying here is that it's x-rays. We're concerned now in this talk and from an EM point of view, x-rays, not CTs. Okay, Jefferson fracture, we see a lot of Jefferson fractures. Okay, it's not it's something that we see often. That is why we need adequate open mouth views. All right, so C1 burst, typical cause axial load, diving to shallow water, being hit in the head, community assault, etc. Okay, stable, they generally have no neurology, and then the open mouth is asymmetry of the lateral masses. This is not a great picture, but you can all see the error. There's a lateral mass, and that's completely asymmetrical. That's where the fracture is. This is more symmetrical on this side. If you look at that distance versus that distance is a huge gap and the tips are off. So you're suspecting a Jefferson burst type fracture. Clearly a CT or MRI is needed. That's not debatable. Uh, a, a nice diagrammatic picture of it. Okay. And then displacement of the masses beyond the body of C2. Two millimeters. We don't mention this a lot in terms of measurement. It is in the books, two millimeter, two millimeters, not that easy to measure. It's easier just to eyeball it and then draw lines. So you draw lines on the lateral masses, lines on the lateral masses, you see they're off, then you go from there. Okay. It's an unstable fracture, as we all know. There's the types. No one expects anyone to know the types unless you're a radiologist or a neurosurgeon. But the commonest that we see, uh, we see quite a lot of anterior arch Jeffersons. Um, and then more so burst fractures. And you can see the ligaments over there. Okay, so just know there's at least five types, four to five types. Okay. And then there's a nice diagrammatic of it. And that's clearly a CT, not an X-ray, um, of the Jefferson fracture. And then more pictures. So after you've seen quite a few pictures, you'll understand a Jefferson. That's uh, coming down. Onto it, peg, lateral masses. This is a very nice schematic of what you want to see in an open mouth x ray. Okay, so lateral masses, draw my line, draw my line. It's supposed to be two millimeters, yes. Know the two millimeter measurement, but stick with your lines. And then the equidistant between the peg and then the medial mass. You guys can see this diagrammatic there. Um, very off, very out. Yeah processes are then out, the lateral masses are out. Nice x-ray, the arrow is there for us. Same sort of thing, the lateral mass completely off, fractures here, very little space there. Nice document. This is not a CT, by the way, this is an x-ray. This is a x-ray tomogram, an old-fashioned tomogram. That's why it's not clear and sharp. 
So it's an X-ray that rotated around the neck a few times to give you try and give you a better view. Okay, and then the types there, and then fractures over there. The same there. If you look over there, and we measured that, so C1, C2, that would be definitely more than six millimeters. And then the fracture through the ring there on C2. Same story there, but that's a CT, so we're going to go quickly past it. Bilateral facet dislocation was next. What can you see on this X-ray? I need to ask you guys questions. I feel like I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> okay. Um, ADI C1, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Inadequate. I don't have C71, but we're just looking at that. My AP view, spinous processes, looking at my discs, my intervertebral spaces. Clearly, there's a problem there. Okay, there is the problem. Very obvious. If you measure this, you'd see the soft tissue is not necessarily, the prevertebral soft tissue is not necessarily swollen, but your lines are definitely out. Prevertebral, posterior vertebral, there's a big step over there. Further on in the lecture, we'll, we'll um, come across where if it's less than 50%, more than 50%, you can ascertain that it's either unifacet or bifacet dislocation. So if you read here, bifacet complete anterior of the vertebral body, extreme hyperflexion associated with very high risk of cord damage. If you look at that picture and you have to take that distance, if you could draw and you take that distance, it would be less than 50%. If you look at this picture, that distance and then that distance would be more than 50%. Okay, so most likely, although I labeled it by, this is probably a unifacet dislocation and this would be a bifacet dislocation. Okay, uh, what are we doing here? Just a scan, subluxed facet, you can see that. This is a case, a Tigerberg case, um, over here. So let's look at it again. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A little bit of T1. If I had to measure, let's just go again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Clearly soft tissue swelling, but Okay, more than 22, C6 more than 22, that looks okay. My ADI, I can't see very well. I follow my, follow my vertebral lines, massive step over there. Okay, if I had to put a little line through there and I go that way, and I do it as a ratio, this guy is probably less than 50%, so it's probably a unifacet dislocation. Then he was reduced two hours later, looks much better. Okay, still some soft tissue swelling. Okay, um, we're going to come back to this towards the end of the lecture. Uh, I got some pictures of how to do the reduction and we're just going to talk about the medical legal aspects of it. So the next one would be odontoid fracture type 2 and 3. Okay, very easy type 2 base and then type 3 through the body of C3 unstable. The most difficult one to see, so one we can see quite easily, two is quite obvious, it's three. But sometimes on an X-ray, unless you look very carefully and you play with the, not so much the call of the contrast, but you, if you um, use the pack system and you, you make it lighter and darker, you can see type three more easily. Okay, just another schematic diagram of it. So remember two and three is unstable, one is stable. The thing is, if you're in a district or regional and you have a type one, I would still send the patient for imaging. Yes, it's stable. But I'd still send him for a CT or an MRI. And most likely he's got no, no neurology, but I would still confirm what I saw. Same picture over here. And what I said, so you got the incisors that can cause, I know that's vertical, but sometimes that shadow will go across and it looks as though there's either a one or a two, not so much a three. Remember the three would go there. The two goes across and a one is on the tip. Okay. Same picture, nice schematic. These ligaments are the ones that are disrupted when you have um, inequality in terms of the peg going through C1. Okay, this is a lateral. That's why, as we say, you've got to have all four x-rays, all four views. Not as clear as what you'd like to think of. The arrow is helping us. But you need a good lateral. You need to measure your ADI. And you need a good open mouth. This is not an easy x-ray. I mean, there's a black shadow. But if you follow the line, if you follow the periosteal line, you can see disruption there. If you follow the line here, you can see clear disruption there. That's just confirmed on CT. Okay. 
That's in type one, simple type one with a CT from the front there. Okay, so let's look at this case. What do we see on this case? If you look at this X-ray, I'm trying to remember the case. So ADI can't really measure it. So let's look at our, our numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's not adequate. There's something going on here. Can you guys see that? Soft tissue, if I measure that as normal, but I can't see the extent of my peg. I can't see the full periosteal outlining of my peg on C2. So there's an issue there confirmed on CT, and then that would be a type 2, and then a type 3 there. So suspicious looking C1, C2. Soft tissue is okay. I don't have adequate views. I would like an open mouth. I don't have an open mouth. I'd like an AP. I don't have it. Um, and then that's confirmed there. So that's any other any other fracture dislocation, bone disorders. Don't worry about that. I mean, Atlanta axial dislocation. Patients are generally not alive if they have that, but that's quite severe and significant. Um, and then a hangman's fracture. So C2 hangman's fracture. Uh, if you have a look at it, it's again through the pedicles of C2. And the way it's caused in the modern day is you force back by impact of the car on C2 with generally some sort of obstruction from a seat belt and not. Okay, there you go. That's a nice schematic. All right. On X-ray, it is not easy at all. If you look very carefully, it's unstable of C2, forward displacement of C1, and the body of C2 on C3. Traumatic spondylolisthesis. I say that. There it is there. Not easy to see. Okay. And then different types. You don't need to know the types. All you need to look for is the fracture and the displacement. Same over there, not easy to see. And then the scans. Okay. So let's look at this guy. This guy, that's his birth date, by the way. That's not the date the scan was done. He's got a significant amount of trauma going on there. So one, two, three is a problem. Four, five, six, seven, T1, ADI. I cannot measure ADI. C2 looks okay. C6 looks okay. Soft tissue swelling. My lines are completely off. So soft tissue lines okay. Anterior vertebral, posterior vertebral, spinal lamin and spinous processes. Off with the step, off with the step. You've got a teardrop fracture and you got ring disruption over there. Okay, so this poor guy wasn't in good shape and he had clear neurology. And obviously not a reducible fracture like with the cone. So that is that is proper fracture C2, it's not a uh, dislocation. Teardrop fractures, we see them a lot, we see them often. Stable inflection, unstable in extension. Uh, you know, the orthopedic surgeons love doing our flexion extension views and teardrop fractures to confirm that everything's okay. We just send them for a scan. There's our teardrop there. Okay. Oh, we carry on. You can also classify a degree of stability. We don't agree with a lot of this in the table, but again, let's go through it again. Stable fractures, the ones that we agree with are simple wedge fracture a neural arch fracture of the atlas, and a clay shovelist fracture. The rest, we feel, are unstable. The unstables we agree with, bilateral facet, flexion teardrop, extension teardrop, a hangman, a Jefferson, and a hyperextension fracture dislocation. So what you need to remember is, what you can think of is, you can remember the stable ones, and everything else is unstable. So the stable one being a clay shovelist fracture, the arch fracture and a simple wedge fracture. Okay, stable. So just a short case. 23 year old jumped into the pool after five beers on New Year's Day. Mixed neurology of the GCS 1515. I would ask you guys a question. Is that stable or unstable? I want to do that as a poll. Come then. 
I think we're going to do it as a poll. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll run the poll now. And we can. what we'll do is we'll use the same poll. So if you've got more for stable and unstable, um, guys can just use the same poll and just change your answer. OK. Um, so looking at the x-ray again, counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a little bit of T1. ADI, that looks like less than three. C2, definitely less than six. C6, probably more than 22. Little teardrop there. Stable versus unstable. And he's got mixed neurology in his GCS 15, 15. Okay, the poll is up. Okay. What do they say? People are, un, uh, answers are rolling in now. Okay. So far, it looks like they have a predominance of unstable. Okay, we've got so far eight people, um, 10, 100% saying unstable. Yeah, because he's got mixed neurology, so that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> really, so, yeah. Okay, so there it is, unstable. So, again, he's not a simple wedge fracture, he's not a clay shovelless fracture, and he's not a arch fracture. All right, so. So the simple wedge over there coming down, uh, wedge compression fractures, and then the clay shovel is fracture. So we've seen, I've probably only seen about five clay shovel fractures. Uh, we don't see them that often, but these kind of guys, the orthopedic surgeons are not impressed at all. You know, they sometimes they don't even scan it, no neurology. Just a, a simple spinous process fracture, they collar them and they send them home. Okay, coming down there, you can see, and that one's not that obvious, but he's a bit buried there. And then a nice, so what's really nice in, in a tertiary type center with a good scanner is that you get these 3D reconstructions, but start with your C spines, then maybe a CT plus or minus MRI, and then the 3D reconstruction. Always look at the reconstruction last if that's what you've got. Okay, transverse process fractures. Um, think about the transverse process fractures. Uh, they're normally associated with trauma in this environment, gunshot knife, and you have vertebral artery injury, so you always need to do a CTA. So it's not so much a bony issue, it's a vascular issue, similar to your thoracic inlet injuries. The reason we, so if you got a, uh, a external process, first and second rib injuries, a sternal fracture. You need to do CTA for thoracic inlet injuries, being your vascular injuries. Okay, let's just look at this again. So the unilateral and bifacet dislocation, we're going to focus a bit more on this. How's my time, guys? All right. Looking good. Okay, so uni and bifacet lateral, bifacet dislocations, flexion, rotation, painful neck, Easy to miss supine, bow tie sign. Bow tie sign, we're not going to focus on that. It's not that easy to see. Uh, what we're going to focus on is our lines, and we're going to look at amount of subluxation. Can everyone see there? Follow your lines. There's a step, there's a step. Soft tissue swelling is okay. Again, why, why you've got to take everything into account, and it looks slightly, most definitely less than 50%. Same over here, coming down. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So six on seven. Okay. Mechanically stable. Unifacet. If you've looked at the previous slides, they say unifacet is stable. There's disagreement with that for the local clinicians. Okay. So unifacet or by in this environment, in, in this setting, is regarded as unstable. Bilateral facet dislocation of both facet joints. All ligament, ligament structures are disrupted and it's more than 50 percent. So one, two, three, four, five. Four on five, extremely obvious, not adequate images, but there you have it. Uh, with your step, if you go draw your line there, that over that to the ratio would be more than 50 percent. So it's bifacet, regarded as unstable. With or without neurology, this needs immediate reduction. Okay, another, this is a great picture. The two next to each other, unilateral and bilateral, note the percentage of movement. Okay, less than 50, 
more than 50. Soft tissue, one, two, three, four, five, six, 71. One, two, three, four, five, four on five. And this one, one, two, three, four, five, six on seven. Okay. If you look at that soft tissue on both, although that's quite obvious, it's probably not as swollen. So again, a combination. This distance here, remember we spoke about the spinous processes lines that all converge to one point because of this uh, facet dislocation. If you drew the lines, there would be no convergence. Okay. Mm, just looking at this bow tie bat wing, don't worry too much about that sign. It's not that obvious. Okay, so that was just for the last time. So what do we do in Cape Town? Low GCS, significant mechanism. Oh no, sorry guys, the slide is from the collar talk. Let's leave the collar talk out. Okay, so by facet dislocation, diagnosis, reduction in emergency unit. I would stop now and, and, and talk. Is everyone on board? Is everyone happy with the pathology? Let's go back to our original thing over here. Mm -hmm. I'm just going back to the summary slides. So, Jefferson fractures, bilateral facets, odontoid two and three, any fracture dislocation, hangman fracture and teardrop fractures. Clay shoveler, stable. Transverse process, not so much wedge, not so much vertebral body, and not so much unilateral facet dislocation. Okay, so you need to know these here, those two summaries. Okay, where did it start? So there was a court case. If you guys look, 2015, there was a court case. Opelt was a rugby player in the Western Cape. I'm not quite sure where. He hurt his neck. Uh, he was taken to a unit. X-rays were delayed. Uh, apparently, it was an injury that could have been reduced. And as a result, he had permanent paralysis. Um, and if you look in the bottom, wrongful negligence, delayed treatment, injury results, permanent paralysis, wrongful negligence. It was in a small unit, and the expertise wasn't necessarily there to reduce the injury. Okay, it was Conradi Hospital. If you guys remember, it's the old hospital. Um, I think it's, what's Conradi now? Not sure. But if you read here, a legal duty to dispense reasonable medical care. Reasonable medical care would be initial assessment, x-ray, plus or minus reduction if possible. Four hour cutoff time is a random time. There's no clinical evidence to justify the four hour time yet. And then it says here, fail to do so must incur liability. So there was a high court decision saying that if, based on this case, if you have a neck injury, there needs to be reasonable care, and that would be include an x-ray, assessment, and reduction, and then transfer to tertiary care. And people trying to come up with this. So the clinical guidelines for management of acute spinal cord injuries in the Western Cape. This was the first draft of the document. Um, there was another draft in 2019. 2020, COVID came. So it's still not signed off for various reasons. Let's just quickly look at the document. So the decision to do imaging should receive priority. The imaging will depend on the resources. I remember you thinking of small little towns where there's only you know, a little local hospital, thinking like Lanesburg, et cetera, which doesn't even have 24-hour x-rays. It then says, in facilities now after x-rays will be delayed more than four hours. They should be stabilized. Alternatively, current practices. You've got to call out the radiographer. So what they're saying in this document that every facility must have an on-call radiographer that if you have a neck injury, they must come out and then it mustn't be delayed by more than four hours. Trauma series must be done, unable to visualize, then it just talks about that, and then CT. They should be managed according to ATLS. Uh, 
ASCII preventing complications and the procedure should only be performed by a medical doctor with competency in closed traction reduction. Okay, oops. Before I carry on, the, the whole point of this document was to come up with a process and rules and regulations to clinically assess a neck, then to radiologically screen a neck. If a problem is found, then the reduction must be done, and this must be done within four hours on site. They don't want people to be transferred back and forth. All right, so district, regional, talking about the procedures, etc. The purpose would be indirect decompression, maintain alignment, prevent secondary injury, and optimize neurological outcomes. All right, so then the indications. Before we get there, it also involves expertise of the doctor, and that's also a debate. So C1, C2, rotatory subluxation, odontoid fractures, hangman, and cervical fractures with malalignment. Just reading that, you need a lot of experience and a lot of confidence to reduce a hangman's fracture for a start. You've all seen now on just simple x-rays, diagnosing a hangman is probably the most difficult. Okay, odontoid fractures, easier. You know, you've got to make sure it's a two or three and not a one. Rotatory subluxation, not that easy either. The facet dislocations, as we saw, easier on x-rays. So active reduction, just of those, and then alignment of those. These reductions will be done in theatre. Okay, and then contraindications. So minimal requirements. This is all from the document that I've taken out. X-ray at the facility. Set of skull traction tongs, surgical tray, swan neck pulley, weights, ESOC, orthopedic rope, drugs, expertise. Unlikely you're going to find that unless you're in tertiary and a trained medical officer. What don't we have? If you look at this list, we don't have that at every facility. That we have, no one knows what that is unless you worked in orthopedics. The correct weights we don't really have. No one knows what an S hook is. Orthopedic rope can be anything. The rest we have, orthopedic surgeon, you can be in private and the orthopedic surgeon won't reduce your neck because he doesn't have MPS. So the last line is the medical offices in the cervical spine procedure. There is a workshop twice a year at uh, Hrudeskir, an orthopedic department that, that runs reduction of this. But you need to have all of that, and you also need the mattresses. Okay, If you look at the beds, so if you, you guys have been in the trauma unit, the bed has got a step where the, the occiput is lowered down, and then your spine is essentially horizontal. So that's important. The trauma, the orthopedic department at Tigerberg actually invented this bed. So they're trying to patent it. So instead of a, this guy, instead of an S hook and a swan neck pulley, they've got a little scale thing with the graded um, a handle that you pull to give you the correct amount of weight. So there's no S hook, rope, S hook, rope and weights. They've just got this little device here. So there we're putting it in, all right? And you feel it, you've got to feel it going through the outer table. And more often than not, you sometimes hit the temporal artery and then you've got to take it out, apply compression for about 10 minutes and then reattach it. OK, there it's attached. The patient's really comfortable. There you see him in the X-ray. He's in the X-ray suite. This is a normal arm of a normal X-ray. We would apply three to five kilos of weight. Just keep monitoring your patient for any worsening neurology and then do an x-ray and then review then another three to five kilos do an x-ray and then review ask the patient squeeze my fingers can you feel can you feel do you feel any more pain or do you feel worsening neurology if they're able to verbalize that okay this patient this is the guy this is his initial i don't really have so that's his x-ray and then it was reduced and then plated but this process is quite a slow process. It takes about an hour to an hour and a half. If you're busy reducing it, adding additional weight, and there's two indications, if there's pain and worsening neurology, you stop. You don't go back, but you stop. 
you leave it at that, you re x ray and you see what's going on. If you have no joy and you can't do it, then it probably needs to go directly to theatre. All right. Uh, let's just have a look. So, unstable, normal alignment, Philadelphia collar, C stable, traction. This is just saying what they're doing in the document. So, training, there's no formal training. There is a course, but it's not formalized. The ATLS courses don't really describe it. Undergraduate training doesn't describe it. ASCII has developed the program and they're trying to roll the program out to everyone in the province. Bearing in mind this is a provincial protocol and not a national protocol. Long term vision online training course, which is a little bit strange because it's very practical. I mean, you can watch a YouTube video, but that's not the same thing. Um, and then formal training programs need to be established. So what needs to be done is X-rays in every facility or someone on call, competence by medical officers, a cone caliper with the S hook, with the weights, with the rope, with the correct bed, uh, and interpretation of the C spine from the start with clinical assessment. Okay, so let's just have a look here. Just an article to show what's going on that's a little bit old but the fact that bifacet dislocations need to be reduced and then a treatment algorithm. I feel like I've spoken a lot. Are there any questions? Can you guys ask questions? Yeah, thanks, Annie. Um, listen, guys, if you have any questions, either the options are, you know, you can um, put your camera on, put your mic, ask a few questions or questions in the chat, or alternatively, we can go for the uh, WhatsApp group. I see Dave's got his hand up. Dave, do you want to put your camera on and ask any question? How's it, Henny? How's um, it, yeah? I've just got a question about peed C-spines. Um, can yes. I go ahead? Is this something you're quite uh, happy with? Go for it. So peed C-spines is, is, a, is a, another part of the thing. It's really important, so talk to me. So the first thing um, is, is there any value in doing the powers ratio? Because you always read about it um, in the textbooks. I've never done it. I don't know anybody that ever has done it, but it's always there. Is there is there value to it or is that something we can skip? Is that the same as the Swisher line? Yeah, the Swisher line, exactly. It, there is value in it. I've, um, in my, I don't, I don't want to show it to you now. We can maybe do it another time, but I've got great x-rays from Tigerberg actually showing where a child was unnecessarily imaged. If we had just done the Swishuk line, we wouldn't have needed to, to CT him. So it, it is necessary, yeah. Okay. Um, and then the next question is just in terms of um, Nexus and Canadian C-spine are only for, I think, over the age of 16. Um, mm, so, 14, 14. So, is it 14? Um, yeah. So are there, are there any clinical decision rules we can use for kids. Um, <laughs> okay, so no, we just have to have a threshold to image them all. So image them all, not really. So I mean, you're right. So there's no real clinical decision rules because a kid can't give you a proper answer because the anatomy, you need to, it's the same thing, you know, mechanism, history, etc. clinical exam, screening x-rays, unfortunately, uh, bearing in mind the PEDS x-rays, you're looking for four things. Do you guys know the four rules for PEDS x-rays in terms of, um, I, I, let's do that as another talk. Okay. But sure, image children, know the four rules in what you're looking at on the pediatric C-spine x-ray. Okay, so there's the four rules. Make sure you understand when you're looking at a PEDS C-spine x-ray, it's not the same as an adult x-ray. And then you'll, you'll, which is the four pathologies that you think is a pathology and it actually isn't. So, unfortunately, image children, yes. Um, and then just the question, just in terms of immobilizing children um, at Red Cross, they kind of yes. have quite um, like a laissez-faire attitude where you basically don't immobilize any of them. So, that's um, so what are the practicalities of it? Would you, can we just do that, essentially not immobilize them and hope that if there's an injury there, they wouldn't exacerbate it yeah. due to the pain or I don't know, what do you recommend for that? So, so Red Cross is great. I mean, we're all going to, we all work there. We're, you're going to work there. Um, so the C-spine mobilization is prof on us. All right. So 
his his um, reasoning is that there's no proper validated clinical trial to immobilize a pediatric C-spine. You can extrapolate that to adults to an extent as well, but we still immobilize adults. His other reasoning is that in his time there, 20 odd years, he's only seen very few actual pediatric C-spine injuries because of, you know, the whatever, you know, he's got various reasons, so he thinks it's not worth it. And then they also cut pieces of cardboard. They were cutting cardboard when I was there. Were they, are they still doing that now? No, not anymore. Now we just basically do nothing. Foam. And they got a rudimentary collar, so they probably stopped that. So the, the general feeling outside is that, yes, he is right. Pediatric C-spine collars are not worth it, but it's worth just immobilizing the head in blocks. That is the current thinking, pre-hospital and in-hospital. So similar to adults then? Uh, careful with adults. So in this country, Australia has gotten rid of collars. Australia, yes. We haven't, Europe hasn't, UK has and now there's America. So the current collar thing is pre-hospital head blocks collar, in-facility head blocks, up, and then transfer is head blocks and collar again. Okay. Okay, so... Cool. The current thinking, adults, pre-hospital, head blocks, and collar. Right. Okay, In this cool. Country. Great. Okay, thanks very <laughs> much, Eddie. Disagree. <laughs> um, I just oh. know there's quite a lot of I just know there's quite a lot of controversy about it, and uh, certainly most of the recent literature goes against having collars. Uh, it can work as a fulcrum and make the C-spine injury worse. It increases your raised intracranial pressure, decreases your venous drainage. So it doesn't seem like there are a lot of um, pros to it, judging by sort of recent. Uh, Remember a lot of that, yeah. so that literature is not based on clinical trials. Okay. Yeah, sure. it's based on, it's just based on what people are saying anecdotally. And the other thing is they incorrectly applied collars, incorrectly sized collars. So if you size your collar and you apply it correctly, and and first prize is actually a Philadelphia collar. So if we could use Philadelphia collars in a type of a pre-hospital environment because they they sized correctly and they, they're more, they're easier to apply. The problem with collars is that not correct size, they're too tight, they're too loose, they're applied by people that don't have the necessary expertise. So you'll always have that collar debate out there. And the raised intracranial pressure, unless they do a study with ICP monitoring, it's a lot of hearsay. So stick some monitors in someone, make a collar too tight, and then sh prove to us. That makes sense. Until okay, then, so you, so you, you, you're a fan of collars for, for transporting but in the hospital environment. Particularly not, in a third world environment. So if you're in a first world, you know, we don't want to get into debate of training and level of expertise, but in a first world type environment where your pre-hospital staff are slightly more, uh, you don't want to say the wrong thing, but slightly more trained and capable, um, you can go with head blocks, which is what they're doing in most centers. But in this environment where, you know, guys go on a four week course, and now they transport in critically ill patients. You need something more than a, a rolled up blanket. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Even if it's incorrectly applied and their neck might be a bit squashed and their brain might be a bit heavy, so what? Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> it's not it does. Entirely correct. Okay, that's perfect. Thanks, Andy. Thanks very okay. much. Okay, cheers. Thanks, Henny. Next up, we've got uh, Dave Kuti. Dave, do you want to ask your question? Hey, how's it, Henny? How's it? Um, where's my video actually working? Um, forgive my, yeah, I'm just bald and cold. Henny, I just want to ask you, um, I know it sounds like we use Nexus criteria mainly in South Africa because the Canadian one's more difficult, etc. It's mainly to decide yeah. on whether they're going to get x-rays uh, initially in our setting. I know overseas they use those criteria more to decided they're going to get a CT scan. Um, but I want to know if, if you know anything or if, you've, or if there's any scope for using it for the new, the, the West guidelines. It came out, they came out fairly recently and they're just shown to be generally better. And if you know or heard anything about them. No, tell me about the West guidelines. Damn. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll send it. It's just it's basically a West algorithm. I'll put it. I'll send it. I'll send it to you, and I'll put it on the group. It basically no, just I've read it. I've read it. No, I've read it. <laughs> yeah, that's embarrassing. So, uh, so West yeah. guidelines are good, and it, yeah. it's it's more it's appropriate. It's a CT, and basically on your initial uh, patient presentation. Um, but it doesn't really. I don't think it would be something that that, that applicable in our setting because most of the time. Oh, exactly. So the know, West. No yeah. worries. West is great, but again, it's great in a first world setting. Yeah, OK. It's, it's, it's applicable for your tertiary trauma centers in the US, your shock trauma centers in the UK, the MTCs. Okay. Uh, our setting, it's we, you can't really apply it at our, at our lower levels. Mm. OK. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I mean, it's something like Tiger Boot or the places with CT scanners, you know, even places like Somerset, would it not be something that we would maybe move towards just because it seems a lot more it's a lot more practical and user friendly certainly absolutely more i agree with you um we just need to get the radiologists on board you know right. we still we still getting moving up that trauma we're getting radiology you know the, the scans now need to be validated or vetted we're okay. getting radiology registrars we have a patient uh, high velocity car rolled comes in gcs 15 fair enough yes he's got blocks and a collar but the policy here is um, high velocity red patient or orange. We do CT brain, CT C spike. We don't do X rays. Then we have the registrar saying, but is GCS 15 no neurology? Um, I want a lateral X ray first before I validate a C spike, CT. Yeah. So I don't think we need to convince ourselves as EM physicians. We need to convince the radiologists. Sure. So, okay. Cool. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. And good luck to the person trying to convince the a particular radiologist. Well, exactly. Yeah. And the, the issue, so over here on this side, for example, Paul <laughs> Hospital is a serious, I hope no one's from Paul. Aziz isn't around there. Eh? There's a serious problem. Apparently, you can only do, they only allow the emergency unit five scans a day, something ridiculous like that. They don't scan doesn't do CT scans after four in the afternoon. So, you know, if we're going to tell them, listen, we want CT brain, CT neck, or next using West on all, you know, high mechanism injuries, they're going to laugh at us. They're going to say, forget it, you go to Tigerberg. Sure, sure. So we need to convince the radiology department to do more scans according to those guidelines, sure. Yeah, cool. Thanks very much. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, Henny, I've got a question for you. So it's it's almost segues in from what, what you guys were just speaking about now with the um, district hospitals. So when I was at Tigerberg, we had a case where I got into shift and there was uh, it was handed over that there's these two guys who are waiting for their CT necks. And um, they were in head blocks and in a collar lying on a bed with one guy at clear neurology. And the story was that earlier that morning, they had presented to a district hospital, high velocity MVA, both ejected from the vehicle. GCS 15, the one patient had um, at the time paresthesias, the other one had obvious early neurology. So the x-rays, the lateral x-ray done at the district hospital didn't show any obvious findings, but was clearly inadequate. And the story yeah. was apparently that they weren't allowed a CT or they didn't want to repeat the film, so they got sent through to Tigerberg. And at Tigerberg, um, the story was that they didn't then get, obviously they didn't send them for the low docs because they just, they were booked for a CT neck. Yeah. They didn't get another X-ray. And, um, you know, eventually they got their scan. And then when we got on in the night, this guy had the one of them in particular who actually eventually passed away had a horrible four and five bifacet dislocation, which yeah. after 600 newtons of force in the EC trying to reduce it, broke the, broke the table, that you know fancy table that they have, it broke the, the clips, oh. and then they had to replace it. And, and then the guy, you know, it was, it was a failed reduction and through the night he just had diaphragmatic paralysis and died. Yeah, now, do you know, the, the, the problem with that that I find is once you have an inadequate X-ray, Surely the next step is then, I mean, do you repeat that x-ray? Do you then wait to, because you've got neurology. Now you, you know that this is a blunt neck injury. There is neurology. You've got a possible inadequate x-ray. You add a district hospital. 
what is your next step in management? Now, neurology equals MRI, effectively. You know, you, you shouldn't, if you've got a guy that comes in with a um, high velocity mechanism, you shouldn't actually even be doing x-rays. You should be doing, in first, you know, in a tertiary center, you should be doing a pan CT, plus or minus an MRI. So, so I think, district, yeah. okay, so the question is district. So mm. we're trying to, this is Metro East. Remember, Tigerberg is Metro East. So it's Carl Bremer. The guys that have got scanners are Carl Bremer, Paul Kailicha. So we're trying to convince them to try and create at least some sort of a 24-hour CT service and high velocity, high mechanism, plus or minus low GCS with neurology patients to do at least a CT brain and a neck at the very least, and then send it to, to a tertiary center. Um, but achieving that is, is extremely difficult. Kalich has only got one radiographer who's qualified to, to um, what do you call it, to actually work the machine. And you can't expect her to be on call every night, particularly on weekends. Paul, I don't know what's going on at Paul, and Carl Bremer just says no to everything. So again, it's the same old story. We as clinicians want this, but it's creating, it's, it's convincing other disciplines to actually get on board because they've been doing the same thing for years. But we want to, when you want to create a change, you're going to, you know, they're going to start asking for evidence, et cetera. So I agree yeah. with you, you shouldn't re-X-ray a patient if they have neurology. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. No, I mean, uh, so so yeah. What 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 is the? Because now, say they arrive at your facility in a tertiary hospital, they've got neurology. They are waiting. I mean, the obvious answer is they need urgent, advanced imaging and so treatment. The radiology department is obstructive in every aspect. The fact that they're waited is unacceptable. You should come in. You should be scanned within 10, 15 minutes of arrival. That's how it should be. Uh, yeah. Convincing them to do otherwise is is difficult. And now in COVID-19, if you come in with a low GCS where you intubated, you're a COVID PUI, person under investigation. So the excuse now is, is that they have to clean and re-clean the CT suite after every PUI patient. And they have to don and doff after every patient, so it takes hours. Sure. So if you get injured in the COVID-19 era, if you ever ask to do imaging, we've got guys waiting 12 hours for pain CTs. Sure. In this trauma unit. Yeah. Okay. Henny, I see we've got a lot of questions. You've even got um, Sean Trump, who's one of the chief neurosurgeons from uh, GSH. I've just got the last one that I'm going to ask, um, and this relates to clearing the C-spine. So. I know you, so there's multiple ways in which obviously the C-spine can be cleared um, as soon as they come in. I mean, even nurses in some places in Canada are using the CCR to clear certain patients who, fit, who yeah. fulfill the criteria. So initially, you can obviously clear by using a decision rule um, and obviously properly examining the patient. Then there's these, we, we obviously know there's skiwaras and skiwalkers. Now, when yeah. is it okay for an EC physician to clear the C-spine based on let's say a CT or an X-ray in a patient who has a depressed level of consciousness, because it often happens that this it's person not. needs to go to theater and the anesthetist might say, or someone says, can you, you know, can we take a colleague? Can we clear the patient? And no, I've not. had multiple fights with people to say, we can't, I mean, even the CT might say that there's no injury, but this guy is, I can't examine his neck. I can't exclude a ligamentous injury, but then you get into a fight, with, you know, say maybe they can do it late in ICU. Cause obviously it means that the intubation is a bit more difficult. They need to do a bit mm -hmm. more things, but, is it okay for us to say, you know what, this guy's obtunded, he's going somewhere to a ward, I'm not going to, I can't clear his C-spine, even if his CT says it's normal? You need, I mean, clearing, a, an EM physician should not be clearing a CT, a neck CT. You can look at an X-ray, you can request a CT. If the needs to says, can I take the collar off and you've done a CT, head and C-spine, suspecting an injury, the collar's not taken. They can't do that. Uh, you can't tell the needs to just take the collar off. You can, what you should do is in conjunction with the radiologist that's on call, you can look at it together, verbally come to a consensus and then communicate with the anesthetist before a report is typed. 
uh, but then you all take the um, you know the the responsibility for that. But you, without discussion with the radiologist, without a report, should not tell them to take the collar off. They need to dismiss tube with the collar on. What I generally do then is I just get a Philadelphia collar. So if there's a concern, we can't clear it, the CT is unclear, I don't have a report, we put on a Philadelphia and they go to theatre like that. And then the patient must be tubed with inline stabilisation and the Philadelphia then reapplied. Thanks. Um, so we've got two more hands. I'm not actually sure who's first. I'm just going to go with Sean and then Natalie. Um, Sean, do you want to? Sorry? I think Natalie was first. Oh, sorry about that. Natalie, do you want to ask your question? My apologies. Thanks. Um, so my question is, um, at the moment, with most of our patients, they, um, they come in severely intoxicated with That's alcohol right. and then we have to put on a collar and head blocks and they're very combative they're not going to stay uh, still and so especially in the pre-hospital environment so i know before we're talking about a role of ketamine in keeping the patients settled but then again we have to um, assess their neurology um, just to make sure that there isn't any neurology. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, like a combative patient that needs to be um, immobilized and uh, at the same time we need to uh, assess neurology um, in the pre-hospital environment and yeah. when they just come into a busy EC. So alcohol yeah. and trauma is a problem. All right, and assessing neurology is a big problem. I would be very cautious about using ketamine in a drunk patient with the GCS that's fluctuating and particularly if you assess him neurologically. I don't have the right answer for a, a drunk combative trauma patient that you're trying to immobilize with a collar and head blocks. There, there's no right answer for that. Um, we discourage the use of any sedative or anxiolytic. What you can potentially use is maybe some uh, fentanyl. Uh, we use a bit of fentanyl in a trauma patient, 50 to 100 mics, possibly. I wouldn't use ketamine. Some guys use Dormicum way too frequently. So the answer is no, don't sedate a drunk trauma patient. Rather um, restrain them, as in arms and legs, if you can. Uh, still put on your head blocks. If the collar is creating a problem, then remove the collar because that can, you know, a patient that's moving around it can create more trauma than what it's worth. So head blocks and then try and restrain the patient. Chemically restrain is not a good thing. And then that follows on to drunk trauma patients with any GCS below 15 needs a CT brain. Okay. CT brain, if you suspect a neck injury, CT neck. You're not going to get adequate C-spine x-rays in a drunk patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can't send a drunk patient to the radiology suite for for x-ray views where they're not going to even open their mouth and cooperate. Yeah. So, um, so head blocks, restrain. What I mean by restrain is in tie the wrists, okay, and then tie the feet. And then you unfortunately have to sit with the patient and hold them down until they sober up. Okay, we had a um, case two weeks ago of <clears throat> a drunk patient that was stabbed in the head and then sutured, but his GCS is documented as 14, sent home, came back two days later, seizures, and he had multiple contusions and bleeds. It just goes to the fact that you cannot assess a drunk patient neurologically. Yeah. You, you're either going to scan him head to toe, or you're going to wait for him to sober up and then reassess. But we don't have the time to wait for everyone to sober up. Yeah. So scan the patient and stay away from... Um, sedative agents in a drunk patient. Too many times in the front room, so you guys know tiger book trauma is out of control most of the time. And these guys get given Dormicum and then they sat, drop, stop breathing, and need a tube. Okay. Yeah. And if you've got a very drunk combative patient that needs to be scanned, you intubate the patient. You then RSI him you properly sedate, take him to scan and put him in recess. Okay. Okay. Thank so, you. Cool.
Cool, thanks. Uh, Sean, do you want to jump in? Um, yeah, sure, Dr. Afrikan, thanks so much for a great talk. Thanks, Cameron. Um, my only brief uh, thought was just on the MRI um, thing. Yes. MRIs are very, very controversial. Um, I think um, it's quite a tough decision, but on the most part, it's very rare that the MRI will ever add anything that will change your initial management if there's something clear on the on the x-ray okay. and okay. that the patient is alert and well. So if a patient comes in with, with a good uh, coma score who you can um, assess well and they've got mm. a, a clear dislocation on the neck, they don't yes. need anything further, they need it to be reduced. Um, the neurology um, as an indication for an MRI is controversial, but probably about 1% of the time mm. might add something but it's okay. generally not dangerous. Um, but waiting, we know, is dangerous. Um, sure. So I think unless we sort of in a in a very well set up area where we can literally come to the door, get an X-ray, go for an MR, and within 15 minutes come back um, and get reduced, I think it's better to to act on a uh, on an X-ray. Um, the only time I guess it can be tricky is if somebody's very obtunded and you can't examine them and you're not yeah. sure um, if there is neurology or not, then sometimes you would need to do an MRI on those, in those patients. But generally, if there's an X-ray or a CT that can show you a bifacet dislocation, you know yeah. you need to reduce it, and the benefits far outweigh the risks mm. of, of doing that. Um, but it is a very tricky, a tricky one. Yeah. Do you agree with um, in neurosurgery? Huh? Do, you, do you agree with the... Unifacet versus bifacet. Everyone's saying unifacet is stable. Um, I must be honest. I think you. I agree with you. Um, yeah, uh, unifacet because, is a hundred percent an unstable injury. Um, there's yeah, no, yeah, there's yeah. no question. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, who's your uh, you guys? Who's your lead? Who's who's pushing the reductions? I forget his name. It's Nick Kruger. Nick Kruger Esky. I mean, he's. I mentioned that he's done workshops twice a year. Is that still correct? You guys are still doing yes, that? Yes, yeah, they're, they're wonderful workshops. If if anybody hasn't gone, I'd really recommend uh, yeah. going. They really are great. Yeah, I've been to two of them. Um, the guys, I think, must definitely go. And that policy, as far as I know, that policy still isn't signed off. Do you know anything more around that? What's, what's that policy? The four-hour reduction policy. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's tough. I think um, Nick tries to push it, and it is pretty much pushed for for low velocity um, dislocations. For yeah. high velocity injuries, it's different. Um, mm -hmm. But I think for low velocity injuries, um, pretty much everyone tries to apply to that to that rule. Obviously, it's yeah. easy to sit in in either Tigerberg or Kuriskia and say that, knowing that you've got backup in case something goes yeah. wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But I think on the on the generals that people sort of feel a bit more comfortable with it, um, probably about one percent of the time can there be a neurological t deterioration um, with a close reduction, um, and that's from big trials that um, that we know that for sure it's a safe thing to do. It's about one percent that, sure. that tends to go wrong, um, and on the MRs we know that probably about 30, 35 percent of them will have what they call a disc at risk which is when somebody will have a, a, a disc prolapse that people think might be a contraindication to um, to reduction to close reduction, um, mm -hmm. but actually is will with ligament taxes will actually sort itself out in the reduction. Um, yeah. And if there's a failed reduction for whatever reason, whether it's a facet that's stuck in the way or a fracture that won't let it come in. Um, mm -hmm. The first operation they do is an, an anterior based approach where you do an ACDF and you take the whole disc out anyway. So it's very uh, rare that we actually do MRs even before we go to theatre, um, exactly. because the discs tend to not be a problem. Um, exactly. It's only really in those obtunded patients that you don't know what's going on, um, and there's a sort of a complicated injury that you would then do an MR. Yeah, yeah. You you agree that I mean the expertise. If you haven't reduced a neck with calipers, I mean it's quite daunting to just, just do your first one. And yeah, I agree. I, I mean. That, I mean, Nick, as, as you said, with his story, I mean, he's great at his story. He had, I think his, was it his master's or his PhD? He did on like a, a survey of the Western Cape um, hospitals and who's equipped and who isn't. Um, yeah. And who has x-rays after hours and who has access to um, to reduction beds and so on. And I think yeah. his main point from that was he wanted more people. I think it was something like 30% of the primary healthcare areas um, 
had access to x-rays and of those only about half of them had the ability that they thought might be able to develop a reduction bed. So yeah, his sort of yeah. plan was to try and get as many guys as he could to come to his to his course and kind of, you know, get that list that you showed and then go yeah. back and try and procure the stuff and try and find a way that the next time someone comes in with this thing that they, you know, you don't have to find all the equipment. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's the same in Tigerberg, but with us, we're very lucky we've got a, a reduction room and reduction beds oh, and it's nice. sort of set up and the, the patient will just be wheeled into that area and everything should be there because there's nothing worse than kind of trying to do it on the fly um, and trying to run around and find stuff. Um, but I think having backup from people and being able to phone for advice and phone for help, um, yeah. I think is really, really useful. And and I don't think people must ever feel alone um, when they can phone a EC at Tigerberg or phone C14 yeah. and ask for advice. Um, you know, I think that's that's where that's yeah. where good medicine gets practiced. And I think up at Tigerberg Trauma, we, we do it in the front room. So they've got the bed and everything. We just do it in the front. So everyone actually gets to see it. But I think the key is, I mean, the whole the point really is is X-ray recognition and you know, exactly. mechanism, clinical exam, X-ray recognition. You agree with that? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think the the clinical exam and, and the X-ray patterning is is most important. And and as you said, uh, the unifest. I mean, for me, stability. The definition of stability is the ability to, to maintain anatomical alignment at physiological yeah, exactly. loads. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you're out of anatomical alignment at rest that means it's unstable. Yes, um, that's exactly. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Um, yeah, you know, that's. And also it might have been a bifacet and it might have spontaneously reduced to a unifacet. Uh, um, and just because somebody's uh, holding them straight, it's fine. But if you twist, you might go into a bifacet again. Um, yeah. I mean, those facets, those um, joints are so badly damaged from uh, from that force that it, it really is an unstable injury. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, sure, thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your input. Sure, thanks, guys. That's uh, I mean, it's really it's really a privilege to be you know involved in such a discussion, and I think this is the beauty that we're finding of all the bad things that COVID has done. The sort of open platform is really good. Um, Lauren, I see you have your hand up. Lauren, Lauren, are you there? Your mic is on mute. Yeah, I just wanted to um, say the same thing, actually, um, Cameron, and just echo what you were saying around being able to really get into an in-depth discussion and a collaborative kind of discussion with multiple disciplines. So um, that it's been great, and, and we really appreciate your presentation, Henny, but equally um, the value of these sessions are from the discussions that we can have and the questions and answer sessions at the end. So um, it's been really helpful. Just in the background, I've been chatting to Sean. So for you guys in the future, I think um, this is very much a, a, a discussion that we need to continue. Um, we don't really have very much clarity. I can see that you guys have a lot of questions and are quite uncertain and a little bit uncomfortable around the management of these uh, injuries. So in the future, I'm going to try and, and we're going to approach Nick Kruger and see if he can chat to us as well. And then Hini, obviously, you're welcome to come on and, and we can maybe have a kind of a panel discussion and Sean, if you have an interest in joining as well. So I think we're definitely going to try for that in, in the future, in the next couple of months, if we can arrange for that. Um, Dave McAlpine, if I can just uh, speak to your question, just very briefly, and Hini, you can tell me if you agree with regard to the use of C-spine collars. I think, you know, we put a lot of value on what a C-spine collar can achieve and what it can't achieve. So if we're going to discuss uh, management of a suspected C-spine injury or strategies for uh, spinal protection, we have to think about it as a whole package of care. Uh, and not just place all the value on what the C-spine collar can do for us. So if we were to go uh, with the best practice and the available literature, and we were to say that C-spine collars potentially are injurious to patients' physiology and, they, um, and, and might not be in the best interests of, of best practice, then we need to look at the whole package of care and see in our clinical context whether that's is aligned to that. So in the absence of a collar, what would be the 
substitute to that? Um, do we use another kind of device? And if we don't use a kind, a, a, a different or an alternative device, what then are we able to provide from a clinical perspective that's safe in terms of the patient's analgesia, the access to definitive imaging, their turnaround time and disposition time, the nurse to patient ratio, the physician to patient ratio. So, you know, it's a, it's a whole complex system. Um, and when it comes to C-spine collars, it's very difficult to say that C-spine collars are, are blanket rule good or not good because it very much depends on how you're managing those patients and for how long you're managing those patients and what the complexity of your, of your unit is. Um, so C-spine collars may very well have been shown to increase in intracranial pressure. And then we have to look at the risk benefit ratio of, in our co context of whether sustained use of C-spine collars is safer has a safer risk profile as opposed to removing the, the C-spine collar. Yeah, that, if you look on that slide, so the other part of the talk is, is um, C-spine collar evidence in the articles, geriatric C-spine, pediatric C-spine, and I forgot to remove this slide, but here's that little summary for everyone who's reading it. It's what you just sort of said. Yeah. Yeah, so three hospital C collar head. I think the key is head blocks actually. But but yeah. that's another day's discussion, the C collar debate. Yeah, it is another day's discussion. So yeah, but thanks for your time, Hini. It's been amazing. Um it's been really great to hear your insights to have this kind of discussion. It's important. It's obviously far from over. Um yeah. I'm sorry that, you know, some of our sessions, we have like really clear ways forward at the end of the session. And sometimes we have more questions than we have answers. So yeah, this session yeah. may have been one of those where we just walk away with a few more questions than we do answers. But it's a complex question. and It's really important. So I'm glad that we're able to bring up these questions. And um, I'll definitely work on, on the backside of um, arranging a follow up session. And hopefully we can get like a, a nice panel together. Yeah. And we can yeah. all have a multidisciplinary kind of discussion, which would be great. I think just what we need to take away from today is just basic C-spine anatomy, understanding the, the structures of the various individual vertebrae, understanding the stable versus unstable, particularly focusing on the facet dislocations and reduction. That's really all we want to achieve today. Um, mm -hmm. Collar application, pediatric C-spine, geriatric C-spine, that can be another day's chat. Yeah, I think Henny, I think if you've got maybe some of those cool x-rays, um, you know, apart from what you've showed here, maybe we can put together a little, you know, VAQ type thing and oh, yeah, see what the... Sure. Um, we've got so many x-rays. Yeah, so if you, yeah, we'll, we'll chat offline about that. Um, yeah, geez, thanks again. We can't thank you enough and for everyone for participating.